We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. What we just sang about is a faith that works. I mentioned this morning that we would be, as we were looking at the letter to Thyatira, that we would be looking at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19, looking at the strength of the congregation, looking at what God saw or what Jesus saw in their strength. And it had to do with a faith that worked. But when we talk about faith in our society today and works in our society today, oftentimes they are faith versus works or works versus faith. They are they're almost polar opposites in discussion. Sometimes we hear faith being faith only, that we are saved by faith alone. The problem with that theology is where does works fit in? Where do works fit in? Where, where does that have a place? And it makes it to where works are not important and, and in, in essence faith is caused to be off balance. It's a view that it's off balance and we don't find it within scripture. But then sometimes we have the opposite extreme. We react to that and we say, well, you've got to work. And we just sang about working till Jesus comes and and that works are, are a way that will earn salvation. I don't know of anyone who just comes out and just says that. But it sure comes across that way. Especially to those who have the faith only mentality. And so it causes the V-S in the middle. The verses. We don't find it in V-E-R-S-E-S. Because when we talk about a works based faith. That it's only works that will get us to heaven. That is too, that is offside, or that is uh, lopsided, that is off kilter. In fact, there, is a, there was a society that had a works-based mentality concerning freedom. You may uh, be familiar with this phrase, it's a German phrase, don't even get me to try to pronounce it, but uh, Arbeitsmacht free, I, I'm not sure on, on that pron pronunciation. But it's, it meant work makes free. And when Mary went to Auschwitz uh, in Europe, she went to the, the concentration camp there. This was on, the, this was on the, the gates to the concentration camp. And it, you actually can see it. This was the slogan of Auschwitz. Work makes free. So what it was saying is, work, you will gain your freedom. What, what they were actually telling the people who were coming in by the millions was that they would work to the point of death and then they would gain their freedom. You know, so when we're talking about this, that's a society that was completely off base. It was completely the opposite of faith. And so what is, what is a faith that works? Well, what Jesus is telling to the congregation in Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19. If you'll look at that with me. I'd like to look at 18 and 19 again. It says, "...into the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patience, endurance." And that your latter works exceed the first. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, I know your works. And then he says, your love. Love being a work. Your faith. Faith being a work. You see, Jesus had a mentality that was, that faith and works go together. They are not in opposition to each other. And so we're going to allow these to be our lesson for this morning, or this evening, from this morning. I know your works, in the first place, of love. I know your works of love. Now, as he's telling this to th those in Thyatira, the fact that he mentions love first, we realize that he'd already mentioned a congregation first in the seven churches. And what we talked about this morning was that in Ephesus, the, their, their good, the, the blessings that we find coming from Ephesus and the blessings we find coming from Thyatira almost seem similar. They're almost identical. 
If you will look at chapter 2, verse 2 through 5. It says, I know your works, tell, telling the, uh, the congregation in Ephesus, Jesus says, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You see, they had false apostles coming in, claiming to be sent by God, and they weren't. And how many people would have just said, okay, they're saying they're from Christ. That's good enough for me. They were willing to investigate, and they actually discovered that they were actually not followers of Christ. It's a win. It says, and they found them to be false. Verse 3, it says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you've not grown weary. So you think about being inundated with false teaching. And they're willing to stand up for what, it, what is right to the point that they've not grown weary. But he says in verse 4, I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. They forgot love. They're doing all this work for God, but they had forgotten the reason why. Love had to be the reason for why they were standing up for Christ. Love has to be the reason that we work till Jesus comes. So when Jesus is telling those of Thyatira the very first thing, the first work that they, that they are known for is their love, they hadn't forgotten. And it is a blessing for Christianity to, to exude love. This word for love is the same word used in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. That would show why they had been able to be patiently enduring. Love shows why they've had their faith. Love shows why they've had service. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not easily angered. Keeps no record of wrongs. Love never fails. Love is a work that has to continue. It can't be forgotten like that in Ephesus. In fact, the Ephesians were told to repent and do the works you did at first. What was the works they did at first? Their first was love. They had to rem remember. Because it was love that caused Jesus to die. If you will, look at John 13 and verse 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The defining characteristic of a disciple is love. If you have love, they will know, all men will know that you're my disciples. But if we forget love, then people are going to look at and say, well, that's not Christianity. And it could be coming from the completely wrong direction. So love is a characteristic, is a work from which come every, comes everything else. And in fact, we're told in 1 John chapter 4 that we love because he first loved us. So we recognize that love is the whole reason we're here because God sent his son to die for you and I. So therefore we continue the understanding of love. We show that for other people as we follow Christ. So I know your works of love. So notice the, the second one is, I know your works of faith. So again, we've already seen that, that to Jesus, works and faith are one and the same. That you can't have one without the other because he's defining, he's defining work as faith. And so a faith that doesn't work is broken. A faith that doesn't work is useless. Because Jesus sees the two as one and the same. Well, his brother saw this as well. As James wrote to the twelve churches, or the twelve churches, the twelve tribes in the dispersion. We're talking about the seven churches. I got confused. James chapter 2 and verse 14. If you'll turn there with me. James chapter 2 and verse 14, this is a very familiar passage. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So can a faith without works save him? He leaves it as a question and, and we continue. 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So when he goes and he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? He then clarifies what that work is. Go, telling someone who is, 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 is hungry or poorly clothed, say, Go be warmed and filled, but don't actually give them a coat. Don't give them a meal. That's the kind of works he's talking about. He's saying, that's an empty faith. That's a faith that doesn't work, literally. Verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's not just empty, it is dead. It's dead. But again, we, we can't have works without faith. I'll just work, I'll just do as much as I can to work for God, but, you know, I'll fake it till I make it. That's, that's not what that's talking about either. Faith and works go together hand in hand. Faith supplements our works. Faith is what helps us to motivate us forward, is it not? But also, as others see the love of Christ, it will cause others to recognize, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then when you, when you see someone else obey the same gospel that you did, doesn't it cause encouragement? Helps us to realize, wow, what the Bible said saved me, and it saved this stranger that I met. Doesn't that just, just, uh, just build your faith? You see how it works in this perfect circle of blessings. Verse 18 says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You can't just say, well, we have one group, you know, one person over here, they've got faith. But they're just, they don't really do anything. They just, they just, they're very faithful. We have someone over here that, you know what, they, they, you know, if you don't watch it, they, they will cuss you out. But you know what, they do some great things. They really, they do a lot of work for God. Two don't work. It's got to be one person that has both. In fact, he then explains how that's not possible to have just one and not the other. Because then he describes the individual who has faith only. And that's 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and Shudder. Demons, if you look throughout Scripture, recognized who Jesus was. They knew He was the Son of God. What have we to do with you, Jesus Christ, the Son of God? The demons would constantly respond. Well, a demon believed that Jesus was the Christ. Well, I mean, if, it's, if, if, they've got, if, if that faith can save them, then demons will be in heaven. But we understand from Matthew 25, 41, that... that the lake of fire is prepared for the devil and his demons, his angels. So we know that demons will not be in heaven, but we also know that they believe, but they don't have works. They have faith, but that doesn't, but they're not going to obey. Again, this is it comes down to the concept of works and uh, works for uh, earning or works of obedience. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 helps us clarify what these works are. Again, we have that Jesus saw that work and faith are one and the same, but Paul tells the Ephesian congregation where the works come in and where the faith comes in, and it is a beautiful perspective. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 beginning says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So by means of faith. So and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. So again, this is where the concept of faith only has come in, because works have nothing to do, you cannot earn your salvation. There is nothing that you could do that would make it to where, you know what, I earned my ticket to heaven. There's nothing. It's a gift of God. But notice verse 9, it says, not a result of works. 
So what is the, the result? The salvation is not a result of works. So it's the idea of the, of the concentration camp. If you work, it will make you free. You will earn your salvation if you work. It'll get out of the concentration camp. Well, that's just sinister. So it can't be that. And that's why if people think that we're saying the opposite of faith only is countered by works only, then it seems evil because it is. It's not as a result of works so that no one may boast. You see, if we think it's all about works that get us to heaven, you say, well, look at all the good things that I'm doing. And you can then just, hey, 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 boast in that. It's a very pharisaical approach to following God. Verse 10, 4, I'll read it again. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. We work because we're saved. We work because God saved us by his grace. But works are very much a part of it. We've been made to work. That's what Jesus sees. That's why he said, I know your works of faith. So may we recognize this and be like that of Thyatira with their good, with their strength. In the third place, he says, I know your works of service. I know your works of service. Well, their, their concept, the, the concept of service there is the, the idea of ministry, to minister to others, to reach out, to fill the needs of others. Again, if it wasn't for their love and it wasn't for their faith, service would not take place. I, I submit that service is a result of love and faith. When we have those things, we're going to serve one another. I'm so thankful for Jack Taggart's prayer this evening. The focus was, may we, what, what was it, what was it, that may we serve with this church as much as we possibly can in the prayer? I, I immediately thought of this point. What a precious focus, and may that be our prayer, that we see opportunities to serve and we take hold of them. May, may we see JJ's face on the elf in the foyer. I love that shaking of head, but it, own it, brother, own it. But, you know, but seeing that elf out in the foyer and knowing that we're putting coats, you know, for our coat drive when we have pizza with Santa. I think it's fitting that uh, Santa also has a coat, but that's, a, that's another discussion. But the idea is we have an opportunity to, to help, not just say to this community, hey, go be warmed and, and filled and not bring something. There's a physical, tangible thing that we can do. And it's right there in the foyer. Uh, I mentioned at the, the uh, announcements this morning, we have the vigil family that uh, when, last year when they came and they visited with us, that there, the, the, there was the three of them, their mother and two daughters, and the mother passed away the following day, and we were able to be there for them. We have an opportunity to help them because the house has is, uh, is actually just been, um, they're about to close and they have to be out by the 15th. I didn't even know that they owned a house. They've been in Wyoming for a year. And I just reached out to them and said, hey, I haven't heard. I knew they were coming back to Sanford. I said, well, is there anything we can do? She said, she was in Wyoming. She said, I'm buying a ticket. I'm coming back to, down tomorrow. She said, we've got to pack up the house. So can you imagine a 19-year-old having to pack up their mother's stuff on their own? I said, there's an opportunity here. So Tuesday, we're going to try to get a group from our Christians in Action group after. And anyone who can come with trailers or with trucks, we can try to move them either to a storage facility or a, an apartment so that they can be, they can be uh, served from this congregation. It's an opportunity for us. So we're created for good works. Notice it says, that we should walk in them. We, we should conduct our lives in them, in our service. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. We were in chapter 2 and verse 10, but I like to look at chapter 4. What is the whole purpose of the teaching that we have when we have Bible class? And what, what is the purpose of our sermons? And yes, it's a part of our worship to God, but there's also an equipping nature. Equipping for the saints to do something. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave, this is Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Ministry, the same word is used for the word service that Jesus uses in, in uh, Revelation 2.19. So you, you and I have been equipped all along for serving this community. We've been equipped to help, to pitch in, and that comes from, from the apostles' teaching, the gospel message that we're, we're hearing every Sunday and Wednesday that we're together. From evangelists and from our shepherds, from our teachers, from our deacons, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for what? For building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So notice this ministry is for building up the body until we all attain to the unity of the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. So notice that we'll not be children tossed to and fro. Is this community not filled with children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine? We've been equipped with understanding that we've got a, we've got a simple message that we don't have to recreate. A message that has been provided for us and we just simply follow that message we strive to restore the New Testament church. Uh, and, and it doesn't take long to recognize the teachings that are out there that have made it crumble in the minds of our people, of our communities. We can build up this body to help build up this community to become a part of the body. And that takes works of service from our love and our faith. It says, I know your works of patience. I know your works of patience. Patience. The word for patience is hupomone. And I want to make sure that I, I, I say it exactly. It says the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. So we're going to face difficulty. We're, we're going to face hardship. And patience gives us this capacity to bear up in the face of it. Not cower, not fall back. To be able to stand firm. So that takes our love, it takes faith that works, and it, it takes the service in order for us to be able to remain strong. Because we're not just doing this alone, we're doing it together. We're working together. We'll work, we'll work, not I'll work, we'll work till Jesus comes. Isn't that a fantastic focus for us this evening? Works of patience. Notice Paul tells the Roman Christians in, in Romans chapter 15, if you'll turn there with me, this need for patience. In fact, we could go to chapter 5 of Romans and see that, but I'd like to go to chapter 15. And beginning in verse 1, it says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So he's given an example for Christianity. It's no longer about me. It's no longer about you. It's about us. We will work till Jesus comes. So we, are, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. You know, the opposite of this could be, well, those who are strong can, can look around at those who are weak and say, I would never do that. And that's all about pleasing oneself. Well, at least I'm not brother or sister so-and-so. <laughs> let, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. If we were focused on ourselves, that would actually tear somebody else down. That's the opposite. Verse 3 says, For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus took on the sin of the world. The reproaches of the world so that we wouldn't have to. Verse 4, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The word for endurance is the same word used here. That through the ability to bear up in the face of difficulty and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. 
You know, when we're facing difficulty, where do we turn? We turn to the scriptures. We turn to the scriptures and therefore we find hope in the midst of difficulty. Notice it says that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when, when, when each individual, each and every one of us, faces our own individual difficulty, we turn to the scriptures. But we also live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus. So when all of us do that, we have an accord with one another, we have a harmony with one another to where we're together. And it gives us strength, helps us, to maintain our patience. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So notice when we welcome one another, when we greet one another, when we take care of one another in this way, that helps us with our endurance that we find in verse 5. In the fifth and final place, he says, I know your works have grown. I know your works have grown. How do we have that? Well, if you'll look back at Revelation 2, 19, he says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. So the fact that works were, were mentioned first, then works are mentioned second, is why I believe that love, faith, service, and patience are all works as well. But notice it says that your latter works exceed the first. What you did at first is actually blown out of the water by the works that they're doing now. That means they're continuing to grow in their works. The work of God, the works that we do for the Lord, will build on themselves and will continue to grow. So the idea is we don't just say, well, we did this one event and now we're done. The idea is that each of these... Have you noticed that when we have had events in this community that we've met some of the same people. We have had the same opportunity, uh, another opportunity to meet that person. I remember actually having a conversation, walking through the line at Pizza with Santa last year, and then seeing a lady come the Sunday after we had our trunk or treat this year. And I said, I remember you from our conversation when we were walking through with the Pizza with Santa. So we just never know. We never know what's going to take place. But when we're meeting people constantly, and I, I've been talking, I talked to a lady at a bakery down uh, Old Springville Road, and she knew all about this congregation. She actually was able to list all, all the things that this congregation is doing as she's driven by. That's an opportunity that I'm taking to try to reach her. So we recognize that growth continues. It doesn't stifle. Uh, in in that's what Peter was talking about in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 5 through 10. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. This, this concept of this constant growth, and it takes verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with moral excellence, and moral excellence or virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Notice these qualities are constantly growing on themselves. Starts with faith, but faith needs to be added to. Well, we add virtue. Well, how do we gain virtue? By knowledge. We study the word of God to find out what the moral excellence of God is. And that will build our faith. Isn't that powerful? You see how this all builds off of itself. Well, when, when, I've, when I'm gaining knowledge, I need to continue to gain in knowledge. Therefore, self-control is so important that I'm not just going to study for a little while and then just burn out. Self-control will help us stay in the knowledge to then gain virtue to build our faith. Steadfastness is going to help me to remain self-controlled. It's going to help me to, to, to not give up prematurely. And then steadfastness is going to be supplemented by godliness. If I can remain godly, then it's going to help me to remain patient. 
I'm going to try to get rid of things that are in this world that are causing my, my patience to wane. I'm going to constantly try to follow God, not myself. And how do I do that? By being around my brothers and sisters who are striving to do the same thing. And that's where it says brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. If, again, love has got to be there as a work that will help us to remain strong. Maybe not be like Ephesus that forgot their first love. They stopped. They forgot why they did what they were doing. Notice these qualities are mentioned in verse 8. For if these qualities, this do list is what I like to call it, are yours and are increasing. So constantly growing, constantly being added and growing. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes and says, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed for the former sins. That's why Ephesus was told to repent and do the works they'd done at first because they'd left their first love. They forgot, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. It is so easy for us to fall back into the world when we're not actively striving to grow in this way. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. We've got to put these, these qualities into action and we will never fall. Again, there are so many things that are working together to help us to make sure we never fall. Again, it's not your work that makes it to where you will never fall. It's not something that could bring about boasting to where we'd fall. He who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. We're relying on each other. And notice verse 10. It's really a call, a plea for invitation. Brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. So I ask you this evening, is your calling and election sure? The works that you're doing for the Lord... Are they waning or are they growing? We're here to encourage you. We're here to help motivate and to help lift you up. And That's why I wanted us to make sure we did not leave Revelation chapter 2 and verse 19 without this focus tonight. May we be like those in Thyatira, but not go back to the world. Maybe you're here tonight and you're needing encouragement. You need the love that this congregation has to help you and to remain strong. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a child of God and you need to come to Christ. Are you willing to come and confess that He is Lord of this entire world and also of your life? To repent of your sins, to be baptized in His name for forgiveness. Whatever your need is, please make it be known. While together we stand and while we sing.